I was born from a Romeo and Juliet type relationship. My father was from one funeral home, and my mother was from a competing funeral home in a neighboring town. <laughs> my father, uh, I, on my father's side, on the wild side, am a sixth generation funeral director, and on my mother's side, I'd be a fifth generation funeral director. As you can imagine, my childhood was quite different than most. Like Haley Joel Osment's character in The Sixth Sense, I saw a lot of dead people. In fact, when we'd go over to my grandparents' house, uh, they lived at the funeral home for a family event or, uh, or a holiday, they would allow us to play hide-and-go-seek in the casket room. <laughs> <laughs> the Wild Funeral Home, which started in 1850, it's the funeral home that I currently work at, like most funeral homes in the United States, it started out as a cabinet shop. In addition to making furniture, we would also make coffins and caskets and help out with funerals as needed. There's two things that happened that transitioned us from full-time furniture makers to full-time undertakers. One, the industrialization of the furniture industry, and two, the popularization of embalming during the American Civil War. During the Civil War, if a soldier was killed on the battlefield, there was actually field embalmers off to the side. And if the family so chose, the field embalmer could embalm the body, ship the deceased soldier back to his uh, mother and father, and he would be rel relatively unaffected by the odor, discoloration, and putrefaction of decomposition. It's estimated that 40,000 out of the 650,000 soldiers in the American Civil War that were killed were embalmed. Farther embedding embalming in the American psyche was Lincoln's assassination. Lincoln's embalmed body was put on a funeral train, believe it or not, and it was paraded through 444 communities. It made stops in 12 major cities where his embalmed corpse was put on the, uh, public display at those 12 major cities. Perhaps there's no stronger bond than a grief bond. Whether rational or not, this bomb to embalming through the American Civil War soon created the American way of death. At first, embalming was mainly just practiced by physicians. Soon, embalming schools started popping up as the popularization continued. And by the end of the 19th century, states began to require licensure. Thus, thus creating the funeral industry and the professionalization of death care. The professionalization of death care has brought us some wonderful things. But this, I didn't, it was, is he looking at me the whole time I was? <laughs> okay, well that's awkward. <laughs> this is actually a customized cremation urn. You can have the face customized to, let's say, the face of your grandfather. The cremains of your grandfather would go into the head of this urn, and it would enable you to play with your grandfather long after he's dead. <laughs> In addition to <laughs> these fantastic urns, the funeral industry has also produced some wonderful casket, uh, excuse me, some wonderful calendars. The men of mortuary's calendar. <laughs> and yes, all of these men here are morticians. There was two years, uh, two editions that came out. And this is the second edition. <laughs> uh, but perhaps the greatest thing that the funeral industry has given us is a collection of men and women who are tolerant, empathetic, and servant-hearted. And there's a great example of that in Ken McKenzie. Ken started the Men of Mortuary's calendars, and he raised money through the proceeds of these calendars for a charity, Cam Cares, which is a charity for women with breast cancer. But the professionalization of death care has rendered the rest of us death amateurs. Before the Civil War, death care was primarily the responsibility of family and community. The family would wash the deceased, dress the deceased, put the deceased in the coffin, they'd often have a home viewing, 
open the grave and also close the grave and work the logistics of the funeral. Now funeral directors bear most of the responsibilities for these tasks. And what the funeral industry has been producing is on friendly on two levels. Each year, 800,000 gallons of toxic formaldehyde are buried beneath the ground. In a 10-acre cemetery, there's enough wood to frame 40 houses, over 900 tons of casket metal, and 22,000 tons of concrete vaults. It's estimated that there's 1 million acres of cemeteries in the United States, and buried beneath those cemeteries, there's enough steel to build uh, 2,000 Empire State buildings. There's enough wood to forest the entire state of New Jersey, and there's enough concrete in the vaults to pave a sidewalk to the moon 28 times. Not only is the funeral industry unfriendly to the environment, it's also unfriendly to the way that we approach death. The leap from a culture of death acceptance to a culture of death denial has been no leap at all. It's been a journey of small steps, a journey that's been enabled by the funeral profession. In death, we find the cohabitation of utter darkness and blinding light. The darkness of separation, of powerlessness, of grief, and the light of togetherness, of community and love. In death, we find the conflicting desire for both words and silence. We have everything to say and yet nothing to be spoken. We find in death the mixture of both the sacred and the profane. In the same breath, we curse God and we bless God. In death, we find our most earthly reality and our most transcendent thoughts. And this paradox is difficult for those of us in, in North America to grasp. We like confidence. We like certainty. We like strength. We like speed. We like knowledge. We like the exceptional. And death is none of these things. And the farther we move away from death, the farther we move away from humanity. Death is that sacred space where we embrace our silence. Death is that sacred space where we embrace the doubt where we embrace the fact that we are limited, that we are mortal, that we are human. When we embrace death, we embrace that part of humanity that we all share. We all share in connection, we all share in some type of love, and we all share in grief. Death in separating us from loved ones binds together those that remain in community and love. Thankfully, there are sustainable options that are both environmentally friendly and death-embracing. These photos that I'm about to show, uh, I, I just as a forewarning, some of them will show deceased persons. So if you're uncomfortable seeing a dead body, you're more than welcome to, to turn away. Uh, but these photos are going to di uh, display practical ways that we can em embrace death care. And uh, if we can dim the lights. This, as you can see, whoop, as you can see here, the casket is not a normal casket. We're used to ornate wood or ornate steel casket. This, uh, in a home funeral, which is what this is depicting, is just a, a craft casket. And what it enables people to do, just like a handmade casket, it enables people who are typically disenfranchised from death care to play a part. And the, the specific people group that are most disenfranchised in death care is children. Just for clarification, unless the deceased has an infectious disease, dead bodies are not dangerous, they are not zombies, they do not bite. Except there was that one time. <laughs> no. <laughs> Nor is it illegal to have a, an on-embalmed deceased person in your home. 
we have this idea possibly perpetuated by the funeral industry that it's illegal for us to do this on our own. Uh, embalming is only required in a few select situations and it's a big difference if the funeral home is in charge of the, the, the deceased or it's a family-led home funeral. It's just like cooking in your home versus having a restaurant. And that's a, probably a horrible analogy. <laughs> but if <laughs> having a restaurant <laughs> it gives you uh, stricter standards than if you're cooking in your home. <laughs> you can see here the family dressing the body. This isn't rocket science. You don't have to have a license like I do to do these things. I live near Lancaster County, which is home of the Amish. And the Amish uh, practice a good symbiosis of using both family care, death care, as well as having the funeral director help them. We embalm the body, we do some of the legal paperwork, and then they'll do the rest. They'll take the body back to their home, they'll dress the body, they'll casket the body, and uh, they will organize the logistics of the funeral. They'll have the viewing inside their house. They'll open the grave, they'll close the grave, and it's a beautiful, beautiful experience. Uh, this is an example of a, f a home funeral. This gentleman is laid out in somebody's home. He's not embalmed. He was dressed by the family. He was washed by the family. And uh, in this situation, there was no need for a funeral director. I want to look real at green burials. <clears throat> In 2008, there were nine green cemeteries. Today, there exists 93. Uh, a green cemetery, as opposed to a traditional cemetery, does not require a vault. A vault is generally going to cost you over $1,000. Uh, and the purpose of a vault is simply to prevent an indentation in the ground because the, once the body starts to decompose and the casket collapses, it creates a, a vacuum of space and an indentation in the cemetery. Uh, in addition to not having to pay for a vault in a green cemetery, you also don't have to pay for the opening and closing because the family is able to do the lowering themselves they're also able to do the closing themselves. There we go. Most people in the funeral industry are servants by nature, but it's time that we take that servant nature and we put it to better use by aiding you in the process of caring for your dead. Instead of doing it ourselves, we now need to be teachers and not just directors. We need to be mentors and not just morticians. We need to reintroduce you to, to the value of caring for your dead. Because the more that we embrace life, the more we can embrace death. Thank you. <laughs>